So Kitchak helps hospitals be more efficient and safer with their medications. What we're doing is putting RFID tags on drugs, and we take a process in the hospital that typically takes about a half hour, bring that down to sub three minutes, and in the process, uh, make it safer and allow the hospitals to have real-time visibility into the medications that are flowing through it. So you guys have grown from two hospitals in 2012 yeah. to over 140, which is the stat I got last week, and I'm sure it's more than 150 now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm assuming it'll be 350 uh, by the end of the year. We hope so. Um, so how have you guys handled such just really incredibly fast growth? Well, uh, the key to it is having a great team around you, and I feel like we've done a good job uh, building out a, a great sales team, a great delivery team, a great product team. Uh, you know, there's certainly challenges with scaling that quickly and getting people on board, but um, scaling that quickly in a lot of ways provides opportunity because, for example, uh, the delivery team, you know, there's not a lot of people on the bench. So the moment they come in, that's sort of right into the fire. They're out at customers. They're uh, working with people who have been doing uh, projects now for a year plus, and uh, you get great experience right out of the gate. And if you're hiring bright people, um, they really add to the equation pretty quickly. So how do you look for those bright people to hire? You know, especially when you're, you know, really early. I mean, <laughs> you guys, you guys obviously have grown a lot, but yeah. So our first hire was actually our first pharmacist as well. Actually, our only pharmacist at the moment, um, Doug. And Doug was a uh, actually a prospect originally. So he had spent time both as a pharmacy director as well as out uh, in technology companies. So. Um, just kind of got to know him over a period of time. And uh, some of the sen- most senior hires, actually, we ended up getting to know through sort of third-party channels where we weren't necessarily trying to hire someone for that role at that point. We, were, we had questions about anesthesiology or we had questions about uh, this or that aspect of the business. And uh, getting to know that person ahead of time in a sort of working capacity allowed us to be sure that when we brought them on, they were going to be able to be successful in the role. You've been really successful at selling to hospitals. So what what advice do you have for companies trying to get their first hospital customer? You know, the the very first is different than sort of scaling. So let me kind of split that into two pieces. Um, And the first, you know, cold calling and reaching out to people is not the sexiest of things. But um, if you look at it, the when I was doing market research, I just cold called a number of hospitals, number of directors of pharmacy. Uh, one of those 15 first cold calls was our very first customer at the University of Maryland. Um, you're going to have to pound the pavement and really do things that may feel uncomfortable, but ultimately get you in the conversations with the right people. Um, as you scale, it's really about identifying all the different barriers and then breaking down those barriers. So for example, with us, we found that um, hospitals have a really hard time with capital budget cycles. So being able to position the product in such a way that it's not a capital purchase was a, a big change for us and allowed us to really accelerate our sales growth. What are some like tangible strategies you'd suggest for somebody who's looking or growing, you know, they're finding that they're getting more customers and their team is maybe small still. Um, How do you kind of handle that operationally? Yeah, well, so from an operational side or a sales side? Um, Either, whatever you... So from a sales side, I I really think it's important to look at every place where a deal is stalling. So is it stalling because of budgeting? Is it stalling because of, you know, different people in the organization are trying to evaluate it? Um, Is it because of legal? Is it because of IT? And figure out how do you eliminate that barrier. So for us, as we kind of systematically looked at it, um, from the outset, we structured the product in such a way that we didn't need IT involvement, that it would just be a a web server. Um, And not even a web server on site, just a web page. Uh, From a legal perspective, we worked with our counsel to develop a two-page contract so that it was as simple as possible. From the capital cycle, we moved it to be an RFID tag-based sale. So just kind of constantly being aware of where are those sort of slowdowns and then kind of coming up with um, alternatives around it. Uh, From an operational perspective, um, 
you know, a lot of it's just putting in extra hours and having r the right people around you. So, uh, you know, at the very first hospitals, Tim and I were out installing and doing sales and support. I remember when we were raising our Series A, uh, our lead investor said, well, you, you have a s support infrastructure, so where, you know, where does the support line ring? I pulled out my cell phone and, you know, that, that's really the operation. So if a printer is going down at, you know, hospital X or Y, you just have to fill in the gap with uh, what you have there. And then I want to go back to that other question I had about um, getting your first kind of hospital customer. Does the process get easier as you, you know, get maybe one and then five and then 10 hospitals? Does it get easier um, maybe just because you're getting a buy-in from hospitals and I don't know what the communications are like between hospitals, but do you find that it's easier to sell um, you know, once you have the buy-in from hospitals? I'm not sure it's ever easy to sell to a hospital. However, um, the sales cycle has gotten shorter and I attribute it to three things. One is overcoming some of these barriers. The second is um, we just understand the process better and our team is able to better articulate uh, our value and vision. The product is frankly better. So the third piece um, is referenceability and that doesn't really happen at five or ten. When you start to get north of a hundred, you get to a point where any director of pharmacy is really only one degree away from someone who's currently using the system. So we are getting it to a situation where there is word of mouth. And the other thing that happens, uh, we've had several clients where a hospital will be visiting another hospital to do a reference visit for a technology other than ours. And they see the uh, blue box and they say, what is that? And uh, we end up getting a call because uh, they, they weren't purchasing whatever technology they were going to see, but they, they saw our thing and it was uh, you know, interesting and cool. Okay, so let's talk about selling to hospitals. What was the process like for you to de determine your value proposition to hospitals? Well, it's interesting. We started with just talking about labor savings. And we knew that the process was about 10 times faster. And we were actually able to do enough work to figure out sort of broad brush what the time savings was. And you could translate in, that into labor savings. But it was only after we got into five or 10 hospitals that we were able to develop a defensible ROI around reduction in inventory, reduction in expiration waste, safety, and sort of regulatory compliance. So um, even now, we constantly are refining what is the overall ROI and value based on the data that we have from our customer base. And how do you kind of identify key decision makers at hospitals? It seems like startups often have such such challenges getting in touch with the right people who can make the right decisions yeah. and work with them, partner with them. How do you how do you go about that, and how do you find those people? We're in a fortunate situation where the director of pharmacy is the right person, so that's a very well known title at each hospital, and. Um, you know, it's a pretty well-defined list. So for us, if we get to the director, if the director is not making the decision, it's typically an assist, uh, assistant director that uh, they can easily refer you to. But um, unlike a lot of companies where they're trying to figure out is it you know X or Y VP, for us it's always the director of pharmacy. So what kind of advice would you have for somebody who has maybe they're just trying to reach a you know like an innovation group or CMIO? What is that? What is it like working with them? You know, we haven't, we've, we've worked a little bit with the innovation groups and um, I find they're always very enthusiastic, uh, but sometimes have trouble getting the organization to get operational. And, um, uh, you know, I think the reason is they, they've got a charter to bring innovation, but ultimately they need the business unit to most likely fund it and certainly uh, provide the human resources to do it. So if you don't have the buy-in of, uh, in our case, the director of pharmacy anyway, you're sort of dead in the water. So um, we found those to be interesting introduction points, but not necessarily great from an um, operational perspective. You know, I, I guess my advice to others is to the extent that you can find a well-defined and repeatable title, that ideally is not something like CIO or CEO, 
um, the better off you're going to be because the more efficient you're going to be at being able to call and quickly get to a yes or no answer as to whether they're worth talking to or not. So let's talk about jumping from like tech to healthcare. Yes. So you were in tech, you were working with RFIDs um, before starting KitCheck. So how did you come up with the idea to automate hospital pharmacy kits? Yeah. Um, over the years with RFID, I had sort of come up with this checklist of what makes a good or bad use of the technology and had to do with, you know, what are you tracking? Is it worth tracking? You know, are there reasonable choke points? Or is there uh, a real savings in terms of labor or um, supply? I was talking to a friend of my wife who was a pharmacist, and she had talked about she had spent an entire day picking up these vials and looking at expiration dates. And it seemed to me, you know, here's a person, top of their field, and you know, highly compensated and is doing this incredibly mundane task. So it checked a lot of those check boxes. And it was from there that I was curious enough to say, you know, maybe there's a solution to this problem. So dug in a little bit more as to whether this is something that is a problem across hospitals and whether uh, people would actually want to buy it. And then sort of secondarily, we had to figure out, could we make it work from a technical perspective? Because there were some uh, challenges around liquids and density. So what advice would you have for a tech entrepreneur looking to kind of break into healthcare? Yeah, I think that actually it's good to perhaps come from outside healthcare because you're bringing a different perspective. So if you can pick out where there is something that's being done in a completely wrong way, which there's lots of in healthcare, and it feels that the institutional barriers aren't necessarily set up to prevent their fixing that problem, that you know, you've got a great opportunity. And actually coming in not from healthcare allows you to have that different perspective and be truly innovative in the space. So uh, I actually think that uh, there's a lot of opportunity in healthcare and not having a healthcare background helps you in a lot of cases. What are you like most excited about? What do you want to see from healthcare, from any you know, any kind of standpoint, regulatory or operational? Or... You know, I <laughs> I don't know if I'm excited about sort of the regulatory my, landscape, but you know, I think there's a lot of interesting things um, in our world uh, that are being impacted with uh, 340B indigent care, as well as. Um, the Drug Quality and Safety Act, which deals with drug compounders and track and trace, but sort of more broadly, um, you know, how we're dealing with this growing amount of information, particularly personal health information. Um, it'd be nice to see a little bit more standardization in that uh, space. Uh, it feels that if you're a company that's dealing with um, personal health information, the standards from one hospital to another are varying just because the regulations are not all that clear. So having clarity, um, I think, would really help people be able to create products that adhere to the standards and ultimately um, can be adopted more widely.